Today, in, indeed, it is a great honor for us to have Sheikh uh, Ma'in al Khuda with us, who will be talking about the financial uh, uh, financial aspect of uh, Islam. As, a, as it has been advertised that there are many components to when it comes to finance in Islam. As we know that Islam is alhamdulillah a complete way of life that was revealed for mankind that includes various systems. It includes the social system, it includes the political system, it includes the judicial system. Similarly, it also includes the financial system as well. And I can testify to the fact that every scholar you know, of, of religion, they specialize in various fields, whether it is the social system or the judicial system and so on. But there are only very few that I have known of that are really qualified and, and truly, really well qualified when it comes to the financial system of Islam because it is a very complicated matter. It is a very complicated subject. As a matter of fact, if we look in the Quran, actually, the, 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 the longest ayah in the Quran, which is in Surah Al-Baqarah towards the end, talks about transactions, talks about you know lending loans and stuff like that. So this is actually covered in the longest ayah in the Quran. So this is just a fact that I wanted to mention here, that it talks about rules and regulations and procedures and so on and so forth when it comes to taking and giving loans and, 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 and making agreements and so on and so forth. So it is indeed a great honor for us that um, Sheikh uh, Ma'in al Khuda is with us this evening. Uh, I just want to introduce the Sheikh a little bit so we understand who it is that we have with us so we can benefit from him to, uh, you know, to, to, to maximize our, uh, uh, the, the level of benefit that we can benefit from the Sheikh, inshallah. The Sheikh is a lecturer in Islamic studies and he has taught students from all educational levels, ranging from younger students to those at the master's level at the university. And when I, meant, when I say the university here, I'm talking about Al-Huda University. Al-Huda University is the university where we have had a previous guest that visited us from the university as well, which is Hamid, Dr. Hamid Al-Ghazali, who was with us last year. He's also currently the president of the Shura. He is, and Al-Huda University is a university that ICW actually supports and endorses. Um, I can tell you a little bit about the university, the, the, the vision uh, that the university has. The, the, the vision of the university was founded in 2011, and the, and the vision of the university is basically merge the Western mindset and the Western lifestyle and the Islamic lifestyle within, within the framework of Islam. So this is you know, a great endeavor that the university is undertaking. And uh, uh, Sheikh Ma'in al-Khuda today here is representing the university. And we will have another guest from the university who will give us a little bit more about the university and the programs and the various activities that are there at the masjid. Coming back to the Sheikh, the Sheikh, he also uh, ha teaches at the master level. He's also a professor of Sharia and Islamic finance with a 15-year record of analyzing contracts and disputes to a certain, uh, to make sure that they are uh, compliance with Sharia. The Sheikh also has a PhD in Sharia, Islamic economic and financial system from the American Open University. He has a Master of Arts in Sharia. He also has a Master of Arts in Economics. The Sheikh also has Rijaza in recitation and memorization of the Quran. Currently, the Sheikh is the academic dean and co-founder of Al Huda University, which is based in Texas. He is also a member of the Fatwa Committee of Amja, the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. He is also the assistant director and co-founder uh, of Houston Quran a Academy. He is also a judge in the Texas Islamic Court. And he's also the resident scholar of Mass Katie Center in Texas. And there are plenty more. I can keep going, uh, go, going on and on and on. But I will stop here at this point. And with this being said, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Sheikh up here to start the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم نور قلوبنا بالعلم وزين أخلاقنا بالحلم وافتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق وأنت غير الفاتحين ثم أما بعد Before I start uh, First of all جزاك الله خيرا فرعا Accommodating and hosting Al Huda University, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make those moments and minutes that you are spending in the message for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a credit for you all. Allahumma ameen. When it comes to the presentation itself, I have two different versions. I have the long version that takes up to seven hours. And I have a short version that takes around maybe one hour. As if me, I mean, if you ask me, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the long version. I get my dinner, alhamdulillah. We pray Salatul Maghrib. Uh, I took a nap before I came here, so I'm, I'm fully functional. You know, salamun hiya hatta matla al-fajr. Can I see some, some hands? I mean, who is, who is willing to stay here for seven hours? For seven hours until we finish the presentation. Wallahi, uh, are you scratching your head or? <laughs> Uh, are you sure you can make it? Within the, within the located time, we have, we have around one hour. And uh, I, will, I will try my best just to touch on the very, very basic information, fundamental information that we need to know about this issue. As it was announced, it is interest-bearing transactions in the U.S. Just to acknowledge the severity of this sin, which is to be involved in riba whether you are this, you know, the strong party who is devouring and, 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 and taking the money from other people, like abusing other people financially, or otherwise you are the abused and the weak you know, party who is paying uh, um, riba to other people. Here is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear in the Quran. If you are not willing to quit dealing with riba, then you are waging a war against Allah, or you are allowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to wage a war against Allah against you. And this is, by the way, the only sin in the Quran, as you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear for those who are involved in this sin that they are waging a war against Allah and His Messenger. This is the only sin in the whole Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it, made it clear. It is one of the sins that is causes the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as you see the hadith, I want to just go faster. It is one of the major sins in Islam. Avoid the seven constructive the seven constructive sins, and one of them is aklu al-riba, transacting with, with riba. Yes, it is kind of difficult to avoid because of the because of the like economic and, and, and financial structure in the US as one of the countries who are leading and adopting the capitalist economic system where riba and interest is a built-in component in. So it is, it is, it is hard. Uh, uh, if you live in the U.S. or you, or you live somewhere else, um, I would say that the, the dominating, dominating economic system and financial system is the capitalist, the global one nowadays. So it doesn't, it doesn't make that big difference if you live in the U.S. or, or even live somewhere else where again riba is a built-in component in the system where you cannot function easily without being involved in riba so it is it is difficult to be to be you know to be honest however we are not excused we have to do our best to uh, stand against the system challenge the system and there are many many ways for us muslims if you if you decide to do so we can establish our own our own institutes to uh, uh, set uh, you know uh, an alternative for the uh, traditional uh, traditional riba one. What are the transactions that we uh, uh, need to know about? Bank loans, taking uh, loan from a bank, whether it is an investment loan or a personal one or a student loan, late fees or charges, the credit cards, whether the regular one or the uh, uh, secured one debit card, saving account, checking account, financing, if you want to buy uh, uh, and get involved in an uh, in installment, lease to purchase option, charging the employee when you decide to withdraw from your 401k, 
uh, and by the way, how to invest in your 401k, what are the options that you have or the halal options that you have. Buying a house via conventional mortgage, that's a, a hot topic and among the frequently asked questions. Late registration fees, and I will explain what those mean. Status of the money that has been generated from haram sources before repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Monetary gifts when you go shopping, non-monetary gifts as well. Saving plan, cashing checks for those who are involved in, in, in this business. Warranty purchases, facilitating prohibited transactions for non-Muslim customers. If you are a, a real estate agent or, or, or a car dealer, for example, how far you can go with your client facilitating for him getting finance for his house or for his car. Distance forex and, and foreign currency trading, membership fees that you have to pay for it to be a member in a certain shopping center or certain you know, place, and student loans as well. Those are, I would say, to my knowledge, the, as I said, the, the, the frequently asked questions. The issue here is that everybody knows that riba is haram. However, we need, we need further education on identifying the riba. What does, what does riba mean? And what are the different transactions who are subject to riba? And what are the certain items that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or His Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, as identified in the Quran or in the Sunnah that those are the you know items who are subject to riba and what are the transactions that are subject to riba okay and what are the different kinds of riba once we get those like foundations or the very fundamental information about riba we might be able to identify the interest bearing transactions and the interest free transactions by by ourselves I will I will go as, as fast as possible. However, let's, let's take a look to uh, this kind of riba, which is riba, riba al-fadl, riba of, of, of increase. Uh, by the way, for those who are taking notes or, or taking maybe pictures, this uh, presentation is not a copyrighted one. Uh, I already sent it to one of the brothers in the, in, in the board and in the, uh, among the people in charge here. Now, uh, so please feel free to circulate it. It's, it, it's not it's not copyright. It's for it's for everybody. If you remember me in your dua, that will be that will be uh, appreciated. Jazakallah khair. So let's talk about riba al fadl, which is which is the most you know popular one, and this kind of riba actually affects for people again living in the U.S. affects maybe ninety to ninety five percent of the transactions. That is riba al fadl. Riba al fadl is when you this is a, a good uh, definition. Increase awarded to one party in a sale or a service or exchange or loan contract without providing any equivalent consideration to the other party. One more time, it is an increase awarded to one party in number one, sale, contract, service, exchange or a loan contract without providing any equivalent consideration to the other party. This is the most popular one, and this is the one that affects you know uh, most of the transactions. Obviously, along with riba and nasia or riba uh, and, and nasa, riba of delay. When when you transact in certain items, there must be like a mutual submission. When you transact, for example, in cash money or any kind of currency, any kind of money, okay or you trade food for food, for example, which are the, two, the only two items have been specified by the Prophet والسلام, to be al amwalu al ribawiyya like the, 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 uh, the useless items, money and food. Okay? However, back to riba al-fadl, which is again the most popular one, and this is the one that affects most of the transactions. Riba al-fadl is an increase awarded to any party in a sale contract. Example for a sale contract. You have sold your car, for example, for $5,000, and the, the buyer did not pay you in full. Okay? He or she went through an, an installment, and you made it clear. You did the closing on the car as $5,000, the fixed price for the car. Now, if there is any consequences, financial consequences, like in case of delaying his payment, in case of not being punctual, in case of not paying on time, uh, there will be some, some late fees, for example. This will be counted as riba, as riba, uh, well, as riba. Just keep it as simple as it. It is, it is, it is riba or it is interest. So this is in, in, a, in a sale contract. Service. You receive a, 
utility bill electricity or, or phone or whatever it has it has a due date if you choose to pay it before the due date there will be no late fees if you choose to pay it after the due date there will be some late fees this is an example of a service i mean you have received a service from the utility company and you have to make sure that you pay in full okay the, the, the you know the, the, the bill before the before the due date exchange you uh, you trade for example let's say food for money as an example and again if there is any stipulation or condition that in case of delaying your payment there will be some consequences you pay more than what you're supposed to pay that will be counted automatically as as riba so uh, service exchange or a loan contract well in a loan contract it's very very clear you lend someone one thousand dollars you lend someone one thousand dollars and you give him uh, let's say six months so from now until until june 2016 if he pays back the loan one thousand there will be no no consequences if he delayed his payment after that there will be some late fees or some interest whatever you want to call it this will be automatically counted as as interest now it becomes even worse it becomes worse if you stipulate from the beginning a certain percentage you give the one thousand dollars with the understanding that the one thousand has to be paid back eleven hundred now the first scenario is riba and the second one is riba but the second one is worse than the first one because the first one riba might be applied and might not in the first scenario riba might might be applied and might not i mean the borrower might pay you in time and might delay his payment but in the second scenario in the second case actually the riba is worse because he knows that he has to pay you riba from day one the 1000 will not be paid off 1000 it will be paid 1100 this is obviously riba so this is riba al fadl and this is riba as I said, riba nasiya is less common today than it was during the lifetime of the Prophet especially when it comes to trading. Uh, at that time, they used to trade like food for food sometimes, or like certain merchandise with certain merchandise. Nowadays, it's, it's not the case anymore. And people, you know, pay or buy whatever they want by just paying money for it. However, uh, this kind of riba actually is still is still there, and its rule is still in effect. Those are the two different contracts who are subject to riba. Subject to riba. If you are involved in a loan contract, for example, you need to be careful because this contract, this transaction is subject to riba. Aqdul qard, the loan contract has certain criteria that has to be matched. You give 1,000, you take it back, 1,000. Aqdul bayr, or the sale contract, has a certain criteria that has to be matched. If it's not matched, then automatically the transaction will be will be counted as a riba, as a riba one. As I said, the riba al-bayr, the user of sale, is less common today than it was before. People nowadays, I mean, rarely they, they like exchange food for food or commodity for commodity. Usually, you pay money for whatever you want to, whatever you want to, to buy. Let me just skip all these uh, slides and, and go to the practical example. Before I proceed here, before you pass a judgment or issue a fatwa that this transaction is a haram one that has to be avoided, you need to identify exactly or define the transaction. What happened exactly? You say, for example, so-and-so person has bought his a house uh, through mortgage. What does, what does mortgage mean? You need to break it down to different transactions. You need to ask yourself a very simple question. Is there any loan contract involved in it or not? Is there any sale contract involved in it or not? If there is a sale contract, is this sale contract complies with the, with the Sharia standard or not? If it is a loan, does it comply or, or it does not? Because the issue here is that sometimes in the industry, people use a certain terms that, is, that, that might give a different meaning from a fiqh perspective. I'll give you an example. Sometimes you find yourself have to, you, you have to pay a, a charge that's called the overdraft, overdraft fees. 
It's not called riba, it's called overdraft fees, right? Well, believe it or not, in 99% of the cases, overdraft fees is, is riba. Sometimes you read the term interest, sometimes they call it revenue, sometimes they call it uh, late fees, sometimes they call it uh, administration fees. Okay. You should not care, you should not care about the term that is used in the contract, whether it is a verbal one or a written one. What you should care the most about is the interpretation of this transaction from a fiqh perspective or from a sharia perspective. Is the interest had been mentioned verbally in the agreement or written down in the contract? Is it equivalent? Is it the same? Is it the same of riba that had been mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah or not? If it is, if it is written in the contract, interest, interest, and it's not the exact interest that is haram in our sharia, then believe it or not, it is halal. I'll give you an example. You buy a car from the owner, the owner of the car directly. There is no third party involved. There is no third party involved. And the car actually is for $5,000 again, the same example that I have used. Okay, you told the, you told the, 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 the car owner, uh, I do not have $5,000. He said, okay, I will sell it to you for $5,000 plus $1,000 interest for one year. How about that? Sometimes you get scared. Oh, $1,000 interest, and it's written in the contract, interest, and it is because of, the, because, of the, because of the payment plan, instead of being cash, now it turned to be one year contract, installment or payment plan, and based on that, the price jumped from 5000 to 6000 Sometimes you get scared. Oh, this is riba. Well, believe it or not, it is not. It's not riba. Why it's not? Because, because this, is, this is the... This is the, 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 the finance that inshallah I will be discussing now. If you have the right if you have the right to sell your car for five thousand dollars cash, you do have the right to ask for six thousand dollars cash. It's 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 your call, it's your car. And the other part or the potential buyer might take it or just might leave it. Okay, you, you take it or you leave it. So if you do have the right to sell it for five thousand cash and you ask for $6,000 cash. Why not you ask for $5,000 $5, cash and you make it $6,000 for one year? As long as we are still within the negotiation stage, we did not finalize the transaction, we did not close, then the floor is open. I can tell you that this car is for $5,000 cash. It is for $6,000 for one year. $7,000 for two years, $8,000 for three years, I can give you unlimited options, okay? As long as we are still, again, in the negotiation stage, there is, there is nothing haram. However, we have to make sure that we close, we close on one option. It is for $6,000 for one year. Once we close verbally or in, 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 in writing, then the transaction is over. The transaction is closed. The price is $6,000. And the duration or the payment is within one year, the installment, so it has to be fixed. Now, any kind of stipulated increase because, because, of, because of delaying the payment or any, kind of, or any kind of decrease, okay, because of the early payment will be automatically counted as, will be automatically counted as, as river. You see the difference? So, during the negotiation stage, Bargaining, yes, no, five, six, seven, eight. You free. You can. You can offer whatever. And in, in, in economics, they call it the the opportunity cost. They call it the opportunity cost. What does it mean? If I have chosen to sell my car for uh, uh, somebody else for five thousand dollars, I might be able to make one thousand dollars profit by investing those five thousand in a different investment opportunity. However, I have compromised. The potential profit of 1000 only for you because you want to pay the, the you know the, the price in full within within one, one year so do i have the right to add on top of the 5000 another 1000 dollars which is the opportunity cost yes i do have the right once we close it means we close no increase and no and no decrease so the point that i want to make here one more time is that you should not care that much about the terms that are utilized in the contract, the verbal or the written one. So do not care you know, too much about the word interest or the word finance or the word profit or the word, or the word revenue 
or uh, administration fees or, 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 or you know service fees over draft charge do not care about it. what you should care about the most is number one is there any loan contract involved in the transaction is someone borrowing from somebody else the answer has to be yes or no if there is a loan contract then we need to be careful because loan contract is a is a loan that is subject to riba if there is any sale contract then we need to be careful because sale contract is subject to riba now if the answer is yes is there any additional amount has to be paid okay after the closing not before the closing if the answer is yes then we need to hold a second this is this is a riba that we have to avoid providing that even if there is a, an increase it doesn't mean that 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 it is in the same level of prohibition i'll explain maybe after five seven minutes from now even if there is an increase if you still remember the scenario one and a scenario two i give you one thousand you wait for six months if you pay it in full there will be no consequences okay uh, if you delay your payment or if you default then th there will be maybe fifty dollars uh, uh, late fees that is that is riba however it is not as prohibited as the second scenario i give you one thousand it has to be paid back eleven hundred so the possibility of not of not paying interest paying interest is zero you know from day one that you will be paying the one thousand eleven hundred so the interest is involved in this transaction from day one now does this does this classification make a difference it makes a huge difference when it comes to our like you know uh, the actual transaction and our daily life when we transact with, with other people it makes a huge difference and inshallah i will be explaining the difference so let's take the uh, practical examples bank loan you approach uh, capital one or chase you ask for a loan you know from day one that the, the one thousand you want to borrow from the bank will be paid back 1200 for example well this is actually the most explicit example of riba that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant in the quran when he said ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu or you who believe ittaqullaha be conscious to your lord wa dharu ma baqiya min al riba in kuntum mu'minin and quit being involved in riba if you claim to be believers and this is the same kind of riba where the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, "La'ana Rasulullah the other narration, la'ana Allahu akil riba wa mukilahu wa katibahu wa shahidi." Prophet ﷺ is cursing the one who is consuming, devouring riba, the one who is paying it to other people, the one who write it down, and even the two witnesses involved in it are included in the curse and the la'na of Allah Azza wa Jalla and His Prophet ﷺ. So again, this is the most explicit example of riba. This kind of riba is called riba din, the, the 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 interest interest bearing loans. This is the kind of riba that is called riba al jahiliyyah. It's the exact kind of riba that had been implemented or practiced during the jahiliyyah before the Prophet والسلام, and even after his prophethood, but before the prohibition of riba. You always hear this statement: "Can a rajul yuqrid al rajul?" فَإِذَا جَاءَ الْأَجَلْ قَالَ أَمْهِلْنِي وَأَزِيدُكَ People used to like you know lend to one another. When the loan is due, the borrower would approach the borrower would approach the lender by saying, "Okay, give me a break, give me more time, and I will pay you more. I will pay uh, I will pay you more." So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed, "يَا الَّذِينَ أَمْنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَذَرُوا مَا بَقِيَ مِنَ الرِّبَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ This is riba al-jahiliyyah. This is riba al-dain that is prohibited. Now. When we say that bank loan is the most explicit example of riba that we have to avoid, that is correct, but it doesn't mean that there is no exception here. Always there is something called darura, necessity, or something called, always there is something called hajatun am, public and general need. I'm not talking about the exception, I'm talking about the default rule. The default rule is that borrowing with interest is the most explicit, you know, haram example of riba that has to be avoided. Late fees is the same, however, it's not again, it's not as prohibited as the as the bank loan. Bank loan means involvement in riba from day one. Late fees, it means that maybe yes, maybe, maybe no. You receive a utility bill with uh, $100, electricity, water, whatever. It has a due date, okay, January 15, 2016. After the due date, it's going to jump to $105, okay? Just make sure that you pay it in full before, before the due date to avoid 
riba. Why this kind of riba here in the late fees is less prohibited than the first one? Here, you may pay in full before the due date, you may not. But here, you know from day one that you will be paying interest. So that, that's why this one is more prohibited than this one. Credit card. You ask yourself the same question. What does it mean? What does it mean holding credit card? It means, it means that you are using the money that you actually deposit in your account? No. You did not deposit any money. When you hold a credit card and you use it, it means that you are borrowing money from the credit company. So it is, it is, it is a good example of what? Of a loan contract. It is an example of, of a loan contract. Why we always have a concern about, about holding credit card? Why some of our mashayikh and speakers and dua say that, that, that holding credit card is, is haram? Although it is not, by the way. But they say that it is haram. Why? Because in, in certain cases, certain cases, you have to pay interest. And they said, well, if you show your agreement, if you express your agreement by signing an agreement, okay, that yes, I am willing to pay more in case number one, two, three, or four, this actually is more than enough to make it prohibited. Well, we need to hold a second. It's not, I mean, this statement is not accurate. It's not accurate. First of all, we have to establish that holding a credit card is a loan contract. Okay, you are borrowing money from the credit company. And you have maybe three different ways of using the money. You can, you can purchase, you know, uh, you, you can use it for purchasing purposes. You can, you can, you can, uh, uh, withdraw cash money okay and you can pay your maybe bills which is a kind of kind of uh, purchasing what is the concern here if you delay your payment if you receive like the credit statement usually usually you receive it online right uh, say for example that you that you owe the credit company chase for example one thousand dollars if you delay your payment okay after the due date there will be some financial consequences. And that is haram. Why? Because again, we said many times that, that holding credit card means that you are borrowing money from the credit from the credit company. So you are paying more than what you what you have borrowed, that is that is interest. This is number one. Number two, payment plan. You always have the option of going with the minimum payment. If your credit statement is one thousand, they give you the option of going with the minimum payment of $35, 50 100 whatever the amount might be. Once you get involved in paying the minimum payment, it means that the 1000 will not stay 1000 anymore, right? It means that there will be some 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 interest. So this is another scenario of paying paying interest. <clears throat> some other cases or some other transactions you will be charged extra money, but this extra money is, is halal, it is justifiable. It's not, it's not haram. Take as an example, purchasing from overseas outside the uh, states. And some credit companies, if you, if you do an out, if you, if you do an international transaction, you buy some items from, from Jordan, from, from Nigeria, for example, they charge you more than one charge. First one, uh, 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 what they call it uh, uh, money transfer because they wired the money from the US all the way to the final destination which is which is Nigeria or Algeria okay and number two they make some profit out of the currency exchange they exchange the American dollars to the you know to the to the uh, local currency and they make some money so making some money out of the currency exchange is halal believe it or not it is halal Okay, wiring the money from one country to another is halal. So do not think that up to this point that you are paying, I mean, if you pay more than what you, what, what you have been charged, that that is riba. No, it's not. No, it is not. Now, some, some, some credit companies, and I want you to check before you decide to go and do like international transaction, sometimes they count the international transaction as cash withdrawal, as cash withdrawal. And, uh, and thus, they charge you interest because, because of the money that you, have, that you have borrowed. So how many charges you ended up with? Three, okay? Wire transfer or, or fund transfer, currency exchange, and interest on top, of the, on top of the... If that is the case, then you need to hold a second. Do not use your credit card for international transactions. 
if the company charges you only two different kinds of charges, currency exchange and wiring fund from the US to the other company, and there is no other consequences, there is no other charges, then you can, you can, you can use it. If you decide to use your credit card for cash withdrawal, again, there are two different kinds of charges. Please correct me if I'm wrong. There is a, a, a one-time, one-time uh, um, uh, uh, charge for the for the transaction itself. That is a service charge, okay? And that is very, very justifiable. Someone is bringing you money from somewhere, so because of the time and the effort, he or she deserve a kind of compensation. Now, on top of that, they charge you interest on the actual money that you withdraw. It could be three, it could be four, five, you know, percent, could be five APR, whatever the percentage might be, and whatever the duration of charging you, whether, whether it is a, a simple interest or compound interest, it doesn't make any difference from a fiqh perspective, it's still haram. To my knowledge, you cannot use your credit card for cash withdrawal because you will be charged interest. I'm not aware of any, any credit company who allow you to like you know withdraw cash money without charging you interest on the actual amount that you have that you have borrowed. Now leave aside the, the you know the service uh, fees, which is which is justifiable, which is which is halal. I said many times that this scenario is less prohibited than the other one. Okay. Now here is the here is the clarification. In, in, in our Sharia and Islamic law. We have different haram items, different haram transactions, different haram matters. They are not in the same level. Okay? There is something called haram ulidati, prohibited by itself. Okay? It is prohibited by itself. Like for example, drinking, drinking wine or any kind of intoxicant. Right? And there is something called haram ulidati, something prohibited because of its potential consequences. It might lead or mislead, if you wish, something harm. Both of them are prohibited, but one of them is more prohibited than the, the other one. One of them is more prohibited than the other one. Drinking wine is prohibited. Transacting in wine, buying and selling and, and transporting is prohibited too. But which one is more prohibited, drinking or just buying and selling? Drinking is way more prohibited than buying and selling. Although again, both of them are haram. But one of them is haramun lidatihi, Haram by itself, which is drinking, and the other one is haramun li Haramun prohibited because of its potential consequences. Now, what is the different? Well, I mean, what is the benefit? What is what is the benefit of this class, uh, of this classification to haramun by itself and haram because of its potential consequences? Here is a well-established fiqh rule or fiqh maxim. That is al-haramu li dhati tubihu al-darura. Whatever is prohibited by itself, remember, drinking wine, whatever is prohibited by itself could not be permitted unless there is a darura, there is a necessity. And in some cases, it could be like a life or death situation. Someone who is really desperate, I mean, to use something or to do something or to eat something or to drink something, otherwise he or she might just pass away. Okay? Now, this is, this is an example of darura. And the other part of the of the qaida of the rule, well haram whatever is prohibited because of its potential consequences would be permitted in case of public and general and general need. Up to this point, I didn't say that using credit card is haram or halal. I'm just you know establishing the foundation of the fiqh rules behind saying the fatwa. Yes, that's haram or that is that's halal. So al haram al haram al haja. For Muslims living in this society, I do believe that there is no necessity. Okay, there is no necessity to hold a credit card. It's not, it's not a life or this situation. We can survive without having a credit card. But there is a public and general need for it. There is a public and general need for it. Some some points of sale, you cannot use cash money. They do not even accept uh, personal checks. They do not even accept well, what else. Uh, debit card. It has to be a credit card, right? So in order for you to facilitate your daily transactions, you need to have credit card. Not only that, in order for you to be eligible for any like potential business and, and, and borrowing in a halal way, in a halal way, you have to have a credit history. In order for you to build your credit history, you have to have 
credit card and start like like making making points and making making credit history. So there is a public and general need. Now maybe certain individual might not need it. That is very, very possible. Someone who is well established financially and does not need it anymore, or maybe he was even not needing it in the in the past. That is very possible. But we cannot generalize the rule by saying, okay, every single Muslim in the US does not need credit card. Well, the vast majority of people actually they do need credit card. Now, if you hold it, if you if, if you have a credit card and you limit yourself, you limit yourself only and only to the permissible transaction. Use it for purchasing, okay? Use it for paying your bills. You do not use it for international transactions. You do not go with the minimum payment. You pay in full, and you do not you do not delay your payment after the due date. You might hold your credit card or using it for for years and years while paying zero dollars interest. While paying zero dollars interest. That's why, because of the again public need, if we live in Nigeria, if we live in Somalia, if we live even in Saudi Arabia, if we live in Jordan, in Egypt, holding a credit card there is not permissible because the financial system is way more simple than financial system in the US. Here actually the system is so sophisticated comparison to other, other countries, and maybe in the US and in Europe and in North America in general. So because of the general and public need for it, holding credit card actually is permissible. Again, as long as you limit yourself to the halal transaction, okay? Do not go with the minimum payment. Do not go with the minimum payment, always pay in full. Do not delay your payment after the due date and do not use your credit card for cash withdrawal. And if you are positive that your credit company charges you interest on top of other charges when you when you use your credit card for international transactions then simply you need to avoid that holding a debit card actually is different it's way different because when you hold a debit card and use it you are not borrowing money to start with we always said many times that you need to ask yourself a question, is there any loan contract involved? Is there any sale contract involved? The answer here is, is no. Holding a debit card means that you already open a checking account and you are, you, you, are, you are withdrawing or utilizing the actual money that you have deposited. So th there is no loan contract to worry about to start, to start with. Is it, is it permissible for you to open a saving account? saving account before you uh, again before you jump to a conclusion you need to ask yourself a question what does saving account mean is there any loan contract involved in it is there any sale contract involved believe it or not when you open a saving account you are lending your money to the bank you are lending your money to the bank you might say well is the bank poor enough for someone like me who has only only a few thousands of dollars to lend money to the bank the bank has millions of millions of dollars. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't go like this. It goes with the nature of the transaction. When you put your money in the bank and the saving account, your money, the capital, the actual amount is guaranteed by law. Is that correct? And your profit or your interest, if you wish, is guaranteed by law. So you give your money to someone and your money has to be paid back. On top of the actual amount, say 5,000, you will be receiving two or three percent. This is the exact nature this is the exact nature of a loan contest. So believe it or not, you are the lender and the bank is the borrower. So we ended up with having what? We're having, an, we're having a loan contract. Loan contract, it is an interest-bearing loan from day one. Now, do not tell me that this is something haram li ghayri, prohibited because if it is potential, well, there is no potential here. There is there's an actual and real haram involved from day one. So to answer the question, no, you cannot open a saving account. You cannot. Some people say, well, I want to save my money. It's not, it's not safe to keep tens of thousands of dollars at home. That's absolutely correct. But who told you that this is the only option that you have? How about opening? How about opening? Well, if you want to protect your money against identity theft. How about opening another checking account? I mean, if you have like a, like a hefty you know, money, as they say, why do not you open two different checking accounts? One of them would with only a few hundreds or a few thousands for your day-to-day -day transactions to pay your bills and, and do other, 
other transactions. And the other one is for saving purposes. The other one is for saving purposes. As long as you do not release the information of the checking account or of the new one that is for saving purposes, then the identity theft or the possibility of identity theft goes down to zero. No one actually has, uh, you know, no one has an access to the information of your checking account. So to protect or to save your money, just open another checking account and do not use it for day-to-day -day transaction. While the other one, okay, could be utilized for, you know, for paying pills and, and, and etc. Now, if the reason behind opening a saving account is to is to invest, is to make some money, well, my answer is this is not the right way to invest your money. This is not the right way to invest your money. We have we have plenty of options in Islamic finance to make money out of the money that you have, and everybody have heard about the mudaraba and the musharaka and the murabaha and the diminishing partnership and the needs to. You know, uh, page. So, alhamdulillah, we have too many tools or like modes of finance that you can use directly or indirectly to make money or to invest your money to set off at least the inflation and to set off the 2.5 percent zakat that you pay on an annual basis. So, do not, do not, you know, like limit yourself or put yourself in the corner, as they say. Well, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has made it simple and easy for you to invest money in a halal, in a halal way. So, even if you make some money out of opening saving account. It is not an option for you, okay, as a practicing practicing Muslim. Checking account is uh, not the same. You are withdrawing money from your from your uh, 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 from your account. When you open a check uh, when you open a checking account, yes, you do support the non-Islamic, you know, finance system because banks do not sleep on the money that you put there. They they utilize your money for lending purposes. So directly or indirectly, you are supporting the system. In making, in making, or conducting more haram transactions, that's absolutely correct. But there is no other alternative. There is no other alternative. If saving account is prohibited, and checking account is prohibited, then then what else we have? Again, it's not safe to save to save tens of thousands of dollars at home. It's not the right place for you to save the money. So we have to have we have to have a solution. If saving account is prohibited by itself, and say, and checking account is prohibited because of its potential consequence, then you go with the Least harmful option, or, or what is called in fiqh, اختيار وقلي الضررين. اختيار وقلي الضررين. Just in case, just just imagine that you have a functional Islamic bank just nearby, and they they do offer checking account uh, service. Believe it or not, opening a checking account, not 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 saving one, opening a checking account in a traditional bank becomes prohibited. Why? Because the Islamic alternative is there. There is no excuse. But for the time being, as Muslims living in the U.S., there is no Islamic alternative, so then you can go and just open a checking account. Sheikh Ibrahim, how much time is that? Fifteen. With interest or without? <laughs> Type. Here is here is the financing that that uh, I already introduced this this topic to you. You remember the five thousand dollars car, cash. 6,000 for one year, 7,000 for two years, 8,000 for three years, and on and on. So as long as, again, as long as you are within, within the bargaining and the negotiation stage, then increasing and decreasing, okay, and negotiating the price is permissible, okay? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a free and open market. I mean, you ask for whatever you want, and people say yes or no. You take it or you relieve it. Once we close, once we say, well, this car is for $6,000 for one year, then, then it is closed. It is closed. The, the price cannot be increased, and meanwhile, it cannot be decreased. It has to be $6,000 for one, for one year. Practically speaking, when you find us in, in the U.S. here, you, you bring a third party to pay on your behalf. You bring a third party to, you know, to pay on your behalf. If you want to buy... If you want to buy, let's say a house, okay, you bring a mortgage company. Let me just you know integrate two different topics together. When you when you buy a house via conventional mortgage process, you you bring a third party, which is the mortgage company, not to buy the house for you, no, but to pay the price of the house on your behalf to the landlord. It means that the mortgage company is lending you the money, but instead of handling the money cash to you, they just pay it on your behalf to the to the landlord. They pay on your behalf $200,000 and you have to pay it 
back to 150 within certain period of time. Within certain period of time. Now here is here is the fundamental issue that we have against mortgage and against traditional financing. Okay, that the third party is not taking any risk. It is a risk less trans literally it is a risk less transaction. Okay, when the mortgage company pays 100,000 your behalf and take it back 120 or 130, this is a risk less transaction. Now in our Sharia and our Deen, taking a profit is not permissible without taking risk. You don't have to lose money. You don't have to incur loss, but you have to be responsible enough to share some of the risk of the transaction. Prophet alayhi salatu was salam naha an bay'i ma lam yuqbad wa an ribhi ma lam yudman. Prophet alayhi salam prohibited from, number one, bay'i ma lam yuqbad, from selling before possessing. If you want to sell something, you have to own it. You have to possess it. In other words, it has to be under your collateral. Okay? You have to be the responsible, the liable party. After owning it, you can you can sell it for for you know extra money, or you can you can make money. But again, you have to possess, you have to own first. Prophet ﷺ as well as he prohibited from taking profit without taking liability. There is a well established, well established qaida, fiqh maxim, which is actually a hadith. Prophet ﷺ said al kharaju bil daman. Al-Kharaj al very simple, very simple and straightforward rule. It means profit follows liability. Profit follows liability. Al-Kharaj al You want to make money, that's fine. But again, you need to take the you need to take the risk. If you want to Islamize the finance system, you need to ask the bank. Even if the bank is still called Chase or or, or uh, or, or, or Capital One, or, or, or Countrywide, or whatever the name might be, or even Freddie Mac, okay, although it's not, a, it's not a bank. If you want to Islamize the transaction or permit it, you have to make sure that the, that the financier or the third party who is just jumping in and paying the money is buying that property for himself. It has to be bought by the financier, even, even just for, for a f few minutes. Okay, and then after taking after taking the liability and the responsibility of owning something that is tangible, okay, that is subject to loss for for any reason, then the bank can resell that property for somebody else for a higher price. Remember, نهى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن بيع ما لم يقبض وعن ربح ما لم يضم. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم prohibited from selling before possessing and from taking profit without taking the taking uh, liability. Practically speaking, again, when you finance here in this in this society through a, like a, a traditional financing system, it means that you're bringing a third party. It could be <clears throat> it could be a bank if you want to finance for a car. It could be a mortgage company if you want to finance for a, for a, for a house. And again, the the financier is not taking any risk. It's just money money for money. He gives you one hundred thousand dollars guaranteed to be paid back one hundred one hundred and twenty. It means that someone actually is abusing the abusing the system. Someone is taking advantage of those who are who are in need. That's why the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from making money from the money itself without involving it in a, in, in buying or selling or, or or trading or manufacturing something, and then you can sell it and, and take whatever profit you feel you feel comfortable with. Now this is the fundamental issue with 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 the, with the traditional financing. There is the minor issue, which is which is the late fees. Late fees is is prohibited because of its potential consequences. It's not a major one. The major one is is lending money for interest. The minor one is the late fees. Late fees actually is still haram, but again, it, it's haram li ghayrihi tahrima wasail. It is prohibited because of its potential consequences. What if you were punctual and just kept paying on time, on time? The late fees that you that you'll be charged will be will be zero. There is no late fees to start with. But the, the unavoidable issue is the is the first one, which is lending money for interest, and that's something haramun lidati, prohibited by itself. Okay, the mortgage company again is paying two hundred thousand, and it will get it back two hundred fifty for the next five, ten, fifteen, twenty years, whatever the duration might be. Buying a car with with a zero APR is is fine. <clears throat> Uh, be careful when you. What is it? Hmm. 
Be careful when you when you finance with the finance department of the car dealership. You want to buy 2015 Toyota, for example, and the Toyota finance department is willing to give you to give you a, a loan for three percent. Do not ever think that Toyota finance and Toyota car car dealership uh, both of them are one entity. You are wrong. They are two different entities. Financially, administratively, legally speaking. Toyota Finance is way different from the you know, from Toyota Car Dealership. They just hold the same the same name. I mean, they work under the like the mother organization or the big umbrella, as they say. But again, legally speaking, financially, administratively, Toyota Finance is different, independent from Toyota Car Dealership. So if you buy it and you finance three APR, four, five uh, uh, APR with Toyota finance, you are committing grievance because this is a third party who is involving, who is, who is getting involved to pay the price of your car on your behalf and just get, you know, the money, obviously, with, with, uh, with, uh, with ribbon. So limit yourself to zero, zero APR. There is another solution. It might, excuse me, or it might sound maybe, you know, um, um, silly a little bit, but, but this is the reality. We are not strong enough to, uh, Modify the system. We are weak enough to like go around the system, or I don't want to say manipulating the system, but we find like a circumvent or try to find a way to permit a transaction. That's called uh, capitalizing the interest. Capitalizing the, the interest means that if you insist in buying a car that does not have zero APR, okay, it is for ten thousand dollars, and the, the the interest is three percent, so it has to be. It has to be, uh, let's say, thirteen thousand dollars. So instead of capitalizing the interest, instead of negotiating, negotiating the price to put it down to eight thousand, no, you negotiate the price to make it thirteen thousand. You change the contract by accepting, by accepting buying that car for th for thirteen thousand with zero interest. If you do it like this, the transaction, I would say, be be permissible. Now the car dealership or the car dealer will look at it differently. I mean, he believes that you are paying the interest up front, which is, which is technically correct. Technically correct. Again, I mean, this is not the ideal situation, but this is a practical solution for those who insist in buying, you know, a car that has APR. You, you can just change the contract or ask the car dealership, and they will be more than happy to change the contract for you and make it zero APR if you, if you put the interest up front. But again, from your perspective, it's not an interest anymore. It is a price. You are willing to pay $13,000 Okay, for a car that does not worth more than ten thousand, but this is again a way to, like, circumvent or, or to go around around ribbon. Lease to purchase option is not uh, subject to ribbon to start with. When you go with this option, you take a car for four or five years, and you know that towards the end of the of the contract, you have maybe two or three options. Sometimes you can return the car. Sometimes you can replace the car with a new one. Sometimes you can buy the car. Sometimes they uh, set the price of the car from the beginning. Sometimes they wait until the end of the like the contract, and then they, they you know they check the car and, and, and suggest a price for it. Whatever the uh, you know details might be, to start with, this is a this is a lease contract. A lease contract is not even subject to riba to start with. We said many times we have only and only two different. Contracts. We have loan contract and sale contract. Now, this one is not a loan contract. This one is not a sale contract. You might say, hold a second. There is a sale contract that is hidden here. Okay. The hidden sale contract is that a bank from behind the scene that you do not even see it would buy that car from the car dealership. And that's why if you, if you assist in going with this option, which is leads to purchase, do not get surprised if Chase checked your your uh, your financial stability and your income and your credit history. Although Chase, you know, has nothing to do with the transaction. Apparently, he's not a part of the deal, but in reality, he is a part of the deal because again, from behind the scene, there is a hidden sale contract between the car dealership and the and the bank. The bank would buy that car from the car dealership and just sell it to you. However, fiqh wise, you should not care about all these details. Because you are you are you are signing a lease to purchase lease to purchase contract with the car with the car dealership itself, and you are not buying that car from 
chase or from capital. So whatever they do from behind the scenes, that's their job. I don't care about them. What I care about is the is the contract. Okay, is the apparent contract that, that I sign with the with the with the car dealership, which is which is which is halal. Lease to purchase option is not even subject to riba to start with, as I as I said. <clears throat> If you decide to withdraw from your 401k or whatever your uh, like uh, pension plan might be, they give you two options. Sometimes you can, they call it, you can, you can borrow from your account, sometimes you can withdraw from your account. Borrowing from your account is permissible even though you have to pay interest because the money is yours. Whatever money you have in your 401k actually is, is your money. And fiqh wise, you are, I mean, you cannot borrow from yourself. Okay, borrowing from your 401k as if you are taking money from your right pocket and just you put it in the in the in the left in the left one. It's just it's just you know, uh, you know as, as as simple as it is. So there is no loan contract to start with. Why they call it? Uh, why the, why they give you the option of borrowing from from your 401k? It is for like legal tax evasion purposes. If you borrow from your account you will not be charged tax. I mean, the amount is, is, is untaxable. So going with this option is permissible. Now, who's going to take the interest, by the way? It is, it is you. Okay. I mean, you borrow the money, okay, according to the technical definition of, of, of borrowing from your 401k, and you pay interest for yourself. The interest money will be added to whom? To your account. So again, I mean, you are taking one uh, money from one pocket and you just put it in the in the other pocket. There is no loan contract to start with and that's why going with, with this option is permissible. The other one actually is to withdraw from your 401k. Again, it is it is permissible. If borrowing is, is permissible, then you know by default, taking from your account is permissible as well. Investing in your 401k, generally speaking, generally speaking, you have five options. You can go with the, with, the, with the CD, Certified Deposit or Saving Account, which is not an option for you. It means that your money is, is saved in a saving account, a long-term saving account with a, with, with a very humble percentage as profit. They call it profit. Well, it's not profit. It is, it is interest because, because that's a saving account. So this is not an option for you. Go with the balance fund, 50% stocks, 50% uh, bonds. This is not an option for you because bond means what? means interest-bearing loan. When you hold a, a T-bill or a bond, it means that you are lending money to the government, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the government, to Uncle Sam. You lend the, you know, the, the government certain amount of money and your money is guaranteed and your profit or your interest is guaranteed. So holding or transacting or trading in bonds to start with is not an option. So one and two are not an option for, for, for you. Three and up, three, four and five are good options. Aggressive, stock fund where all what you have in your portfolio is pure stocks this is this is one option for you and the other one and the other one is international stock fund fiqh wise it doesn't make a difference i mean you have stocks like us stocks or international or, or, or chinese or japanese stocks it doesn't make difference fiqh wise and the fifth option is to limit yourself to the stocks of the company that you work for. Those are the, generally speaking, again, the five different options that you have. So just to skip one and two, you can go with three, you can go with four, you can go with, with five. Even if you choose to have like a pure, pure stocks in your portfolio, which is, which is, which is what you're supposed to do, by the way. Still, there is another, another restriction here. You have to make sure that the stocks belong to companies in which their core business is a halal one. Core business is a halal one. There is nothing nowadays called pure halal 100% stock. If you want to like have a pure halal 100% you know, stocks in the market, uh, with all due respect, you are just wasting your money. Every single stock in the whole world nowadays, to my knowledge, has a certain percentage of haram. The haram could be coming from the riba that they deal with, could be come from the debts because the company is still like in the in the uh, they call it a, uh, uh, undertaken stage. Okay, it could be because because they uh, <clears throat> they trade in certain haram items. So there is a there is a percentage of haram involved in it. As long here is the here is the double here is the standard. 
as long as the core business of the company that you hold the stocks is, is a halal one, then you can trade with, with, with its stocks. Not only that, you have to make sure that you limit yourself to the minimum percentage of haram and world that stock. For example, you have some stocks that have 25% haram, regardless of the reason behind the haram. And other stocks that have uh, only 5%. You cannot buy the 25% stock while the 5% stock is available, regardless of the profitability of each option. Because the most important thing for you as a practicing Muslim is not the profitability or the feasibility. The most important thing is how to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most, how to stay as far as possible from haram the most. So uh, trading in any stocks that, that belong to haram business, could be an obscene materials, alcoholic, tobacco, gambling, conventional banks is, <clears throat> you know, is, is prohibited. If you want to check the portfolio that you have, you can, you can run it by one of the socially responsible fund companies. Sometimes in the U.S. they call them like uh, uh, ethically responsible. Sometimes they call them socially responsible fund companies. A good example for that is a, a Z fund, A Z Z A D, a Z fund, a Mana fund, uh, Islamic Dow Jones. That is a part of, of uh, NATE, the, the, the you know the you know the, 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 the well-known Islamic organization. So those are just few examples. Nowadays we have I think more than 15, 20 different mutual fund companies like Islamic mutual fund companies. A Z fund is conservative enough, is good enough. But profitability wise actually I have I have not, I have been told that they are not as good as others when it comes to running their business and making making money. Honestly I'm not involved in like in the industry. I'm I'm, I'm not a practitioner. I just you know cover the fiqh and the academic part of the Islamic finance, not the practical one. So I'm not the right person to ask which one is the is the best. But again you can you can seek their help in, in analyzing the portfolio that you have. They can tell you up to 90, 95% accuracy how much haram involved in your, in, your, in, your, in your portfolio and where is the haram is coming from. Okay? If it is your option, if it is your call, you can, you can make a decision to drop the bonds and the derivatives and the CDO and the CD and the CDS and, and the other like, you know, derivatives that, that are haram to start with, then you have to do it then you have to do it. If not, then just keep your portfolio as is and try to determine the haram percentage involved in it and just get rid of it. But do not forego your 401k completely because it is contaminated with, with haram. This is not a good option for you. I think I need to stop by this point and just open the floor for a question and answer. Jazakum Allah khair. Uh, Jazakum Allah khair. Jazakum Allah khair. Uh, my question is, uh, I have, uh, my mother lives overseas and she, I gave her my debit card and she takes her monthly installment from me and then the bank charges me a uh, transaction fee around five to seven times. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, because my debit. Yeah. yeah, that's fine because, because that is card means that she's using your actual one. Right. You are not harm, harm I'm something. talking about the service that the bank charges me. Yeah, which is fine. It's right. good, just a service fee. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. That was it. So we have a written question here. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and read the question. I have student loans and I want to get the interest out of my life. I contacted some people in the community who lend me money to pay it off and then pay them back without interest and not many were able to help me. What advice can you give people in my situation? Two or three years ago, we, we, we issued a fatwa in our fact council that said that most of those in America are not excluding funds. We said the following. Our students have to exert their ultimate efforts to find the halal source for you know, financing and sponsor their, their, their degree uh, like you know, uh, like their their, their uh, personal of, of degree. There is something called uh, uh, financially. There is some uh, something is called work study. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, scholarships, grants. Okay. So students have to you know pursue all these different halal options as much as they can. If scholarships are not available or not enough. Or sufficient enough, 
grants uh, uh, the same, financial aid is the same, then they can go with, with what's called the subsidized loan. Because student loans in the US have two different kinds. You have subsidized loan and unsubsidized loan. Subsidized loan is the one that is given based on financial need or financial eligibility. So the other option is to go with the with the with the subsidized loan. Okay, that has that has no interest for a certain period of time. I think up to six, up to nine months after the graduation, they call it grace period. Okay, so this is this is the first option after like you know after making sure that other pure halal options are not available. Now the the new issue here is that again according to our had that that pursuing degrees whether it is undergrad or master's or PhD or MD or whatever is a legitimate need. It's not a necessity, it is a legitimate need. However, this need sometimes could not be achieved without borrowing money with interest. Someone ran out of halal options, the, the, the subsidized loan is not enough. Can he or she take unsubsidized loan? That is interest bearing loan from day one. Can he take an interest bearing loan to like, pursue a degree or to continue pursuing a degree? Our answer is yes. Our answer is yes. And again, it has to be taken on case to case basis. Because again, a college study is a, is a legitimate need. And that need could not be achieved sometimes without borrowing with interest. Now let's go back just a little bit to the definition of a necessity. What we have learned back 10, 15 years in, 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 in college is that a barua is leading to a situation in which Refraining from consuming what is harm might cause, or most probably might cause, to ruin one's life. It is a, it is a life of this situation. Now, this is, alhamdulillah, fortunately, it is not the only definition of the law. There is another very legitimate definition of the law, which is مَا يَلْحَقُ الْمُكَلَّفَ ضَرَوْ بِتَرْكِهِ وَلَا يَقُومُ غَيْرُهُ مَقَامًا وَتَاكِنَ it causes like discomfort. Uh, you know, for the Muslim, and it does not have any alternative. It does not have any alternative. So, if there is an alternative, then going with that option is a hajj, is a is a need. But if there is no other option, if there is no other alternative, then going with it, you know, becomes the law. If you want, I mean, if you go with this definition here, ما يلحق المكلف ضرر بتركه ولا يقوم غيره مقامه. It has no alternative. If someone gets stuck in the middle, in the second or or, 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 the, or, or the third year. Of his college study, okay. No financial aid, no scholarships, no grants, no work study, no student loan or subsidized, you know, loan is enough. And he ended up with having two options: either, either just to drop his college and to go, you know, to go just work, you know, something else, or to take a unsubsidized loan and just continue pursuing his degree. He's taking a loan for this particular individual, halal or not. According to our fatwa, yes, it is halal. Based on the definition, based on the second and new definition of of abroad. With this in mind, if a student, <clears throat> if a student uh, has taken loan with interest, whether it is subsidized loan that you know turned to be unsubsidized one, because if you default in paying in full, then whatever you have taken as a loan as a, as subsidized will become. Unsubsidized one, so so they will start calculating interest on it from the day it was it was issued. Okay, so whatever the case might be, if someone gets involved in haram transaction, someone has borrowed money with interest. Okay, repenting to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and declaring a sincere you know, sincere repentance is the most important thing that you have to start with. Once you just clear your record with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and make that promise, that you know. Make that that sincere, you know, repentance that you will not be doing it, you know, again one more time. Then just go ahead and pay off the loan, as you know, as much as you can, as quick, as fast as you can. Now, do not feel guilty after repenting to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that you are still paying interest, because your repentance will be inshallah more than enough to clear your record with with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Go ahead and just pay off the loan, you know, as uh, as quick as as possible. Do we have any questions from the sister's side before we come back to the brothers? Any questions from the sister's side that they want to ask on the microphone? If not, we'll take it from the brothers. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'd like some clarification of what you explained earlier. In, you gave an example of a car sale where you justified charging an extra thousand for a delayed payment. 
uh, using the opportunity cost or cost of money as a, as a logical reason for it. Why would the same apply to a bank loan? Because in case of a bank loan, say for a, for a house mortgage, the bank is taking some risk and the bank is essentially giving me money that they could invest in some other areas. Essentially, that's a, what my interest to them is an opportunity cost that they're cutting. So why, why are the two cases different? Because in your example, the bank is a third party getting involved for financing purposes only. But in my example, it's one-to-one -one transaction. There is no third party to finance. That's why I do have the right to increase the price and again, in the negotiation stage, as much as I want, as long as it is you know, subject to the approval of the other party, that's halal. But in your example, the bank actually is a, is, is, is a financing. That's the difference. Okay, we'll have, take a written question here. My credit card gives me 2% uh, or 3% on gas or grocery. I didn't realize that this is a kind of riba. I stopped purchasing the gas and grocery through it. It just started a few months ago, and now I don't know what I should do. You should continue using your, your credit card and just enjoy the, enjoy the discount. Because, because the points that you receive is in the opposite of RIBA. RIBA actually is when the borrower pay, pays more than what he, what he has borrowed. Now in this particular case or scenario, the lender actually is the one who is paying you back money as a, as a promotion. So there is no RIBA involved in having to start with because the lender is paying, not the borrower is paying. So it is, it is hard. Okay, any question from the sister's side that they want to ask on the microphone? You have five in queue from the brother's side because the brothers are the ones who are always purchasing. Seven. 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 Go ahead. Uh, for clarification of so many points. Uh, the example about the car, because the common commodity we buy, the flaw I see in it. See, I have to buy a car, $5,000. And you are saying that from the beginning I can fix the price six thousand dollars and pay the slow. And who is the good salesperson? Five thousand dollar car. One give me without extra money five thousand and give me one year to pay back or two years. And that salesperson they sell more cars than the one who is charging me more. Number one. But let me let me just answer the first question. There is a very common practice in the, in the industry called in-house financing. In-house financing actually is when you buy the car directly from the car dealer himself without involving a you know a bank. So if, if the car dealer has some thick background, he would ask you a question: Are you willing to pay it in full cash or half of the price? Uh, I can give you up to one year payment plan. You tell me what you want, and I will give you the answer how much I'm willing to sell that car for you. Okay, usually they ask for maybe 25, 30% down payment, okay? And then you finance for one year. Once it is clear from the beginning, the total price, okay, of the car, and the duration of the installment, and the monthly payment, and the down payment, is everything is fixed, 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 then, then, then the transaction actually is high. There is no harm or not. Again, as long as you're going with in-house financing. Okay, the owner of the car, the car dealer is the one who is financing for it. What if the car dealer says that another car dealer in the town, he says that zero percent. So why I should go to this car dealer who is charging more from the beginning and not giving me any option to have an early payment? For example, I get some money and what he will say, brother, you promise? As long as there is no harm involved, it's, it, it's up to you. You go with, with, the, with the zero APR, with five APR halal, five APR, it's up to you. I mean, there is no harm involved to worry about. What I'm saying is the, the business itself is kind of not doing a good job. For example, I get 200,000 house on the back. And from my brother, who is saying that this house is 225,000, we agree to pay this in five years and then from both if I compare bank will give me 
no penalty for unemployment if I pay in one year. And the first so you are doing that. You are going through too many details. Let's please focus on, on the fiqh issue. I really doubt it. I really doubt it that if the car worth five thousand dollars, that someone is willing to sell it for you for five thousand dollars for one year. Okay. I mean, there should be some some increase in the price because of the because of the because of the because of the time because of the storm because of the opportunity cost. There should be even if they claim otherwise. If someone is willing to sell it cash for five thousand. And care and, 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 and five thousand dollars for one year. Go for it. It is it is hard. By the way, let's let, let, let's take you know some other questions. Take a written question. We'll take a written question next here. Which uh, I read this question. It was pretty interesting. And uh, the questioner is asking in regards to taxes. Oftentimes, when we talk about the suffering of Muslims throughout the world, we are told that the Muslims living here are guilty of killing them as well because we pay taxes. How do we answer this question? It's irrelevant to our talk, right? So let's skip. We'll come back to taking questions from the audience, and I would request for the questioners, because we have seven, eight now, uh, to limit to one question, and not if you have a follow-up question, then you'll have to queue up again. So it gives the opportunity for the others to ask questions. So please limit your question to one question. One specific question. Does that come up? Yeah. Who's next? Uh, the question I have for you is in regards to Forex. Are we allowed to use leverage in it? Are we allowed to go short? And also, if we do have a Islamic bank uh, broker, are we allowed to use that or not? Currency exchange business in general is, uh, is halal. The, the new issue here when it comes to Forex business is that there is no like a mutual immediate Submission. You live in the U.S. and the other part is living in Australia, so it takes some, you know, sometimes for the money to be wired to him and from him to you. This is the concern that you have. Is that correct? Now, during the last time with Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, when he said, "At the hub with the hub with football, 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 gold for gold, silver for silver, etc., etc.," he was talking about a current situation where people used to sit, you know, with one another on face-to-face basis. So it was very, very doable at that time to exchange and to mutually submit the dollars and, and, and the dinars and the dirham immediately on the spot while contracting, okay? Nowadays, it's not the case anymore, okay? There is a majlis, there is a, there is a, like, like a gathering or a meeting. Now, nowadays, if you do it online, there is a virtual meeting or a majlis between you and your client who is living in Australia. As long as you are online, and he is online, and you do the transaction as, like, you know, as soon as you can, any unintentional, unintentional delay, because you have to transact through a third party, is that, is that correct? You pay your money to PayPal, maybe, or to a bank, or for a broker, and he does the same, and the broker then exchange, send you and send him. As long as there is no, uh, like, intentional delay in processing the payment, the transaction actually is, is halal. Why? Number one, there is, an, there is a virtual meeting and connection between you and the, uh, and the other client. And number two, number two, the situation nowadays is different than the situation during the last time of Now, leveraging on it, I mean, if I understand, if I understand you correctly, leveraging actually is when you uh, open a, bro- a brokerage account. You put $1,000 and you get a line of credit of $100,000. You take 99% leverage on the actual money, well, this is not this is not allowed because this is just a digital, like uh, you know, artificial fake money. Okay, just you know, numbers. Okay, so if you want to trade money for money, it has to be a tangible, actual, real money. Leveraging, uh, uh, like opening a, a brokerage account for currency exchange or for forex business, is not allowed. I wish that's clear. We'll do one written question here. So ATM processing and service fee business, is it permissible? Say it again. ATM processing and service fee, is it permissible? I guess that's what the question is. ATM processing and service fee business is permissible? Or like to have an ATM machine? Well, if withdrawing money from the ATM machine is permissible, then having that business is permissible as well. 
The only concern I have is that when, when I mean, if you are the ATM machine business owner, the only concern I have is that when your client, your clients use you use their 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 credit card for cash withdrawal. However, that's something out of your control. That's something out of your I mean, this is the only concern that I have. Otherwise, if you are positive that that people use their debit card for cash withdrawal, I do not see any 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 concern. Okay, we'll take one from the audience. My name is Sayyad Ahmed. I'm questioning that uh, what is the difference between taking a mortgage from the local bank or the uh, guidance? Guidance residential, you mean? Yes. Okay. Again, in our Fiqh Council, we, 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 we closely, closely analyze the uh, contracts and the modes of finance of those five major uh, so-called Islamic mortgage companies in the U.S. Lariba, Guidance Residential, Devon Bank in Chicago here around, uh, Islamic University, Financial, and Ijar Loan. Our conclusion is the following. Guidance Residential is the most Sharia compliant one comparison to other companies that I have already mentioned because of a very simple fact that the actual the actual the actual partnership between between the client and the company is existing there is there's an actual actual partnership you buy the property jointly with guidance residential they 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 have to put their name on the title not as a lien holder, but as an owner. Okay. Now, the only concern that we have is that when it comes to executing and fulfilling the partnership duties and responsibilities, they just withdraw themselves. They withdraw themselves. I mean, they just excuse themselves from paying any tax, any insurance, any maintenance. And this is actually against against the requirements of partnership. That's why, although they are partners. They, they own the property for the duration of the transaction, 20, 25, 30 years. But in reality, in reality, they are not up to the challenge of taking the responsibility of the partnership by paying jointly or proportionally their, like their percentage of tax, maintenance, and, and insurance. It is not the case when it comes to Devon Bank and to uh, University Islamic uh, Financial because their modes of finance is different. Guidance, guidance residential goes with, with, with diminishing partnership. Okay, while Devon Bank and, and University Islamic Financial go with Murabaha and with Ijara. In both in both modes of finance we have a serious concern. When it comes to Murabaha, sometimes they do it in only one transaction, they just jump. Okay, from 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 I mean they skip the first closing of buying the house all the way to just closing on the house under your name as a client. So, the, you know, the fundamental step that has to be taken is not taken. And this is actually more than enough to prohibit the transaction. And when it comes to Ijara, they, they, they insist in merging uh, lease contract and sale contract at the same time. And that's against the principles of sale contract and, 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 and uh, uh, Ijara contract or lease contract in Islam. You cannot be a buyer and lease at the same time. So if two different two different transactions get mirrored, like intermingled together, okay, at the same time, while each one of them has, has different rules, duties, and responsibilities, then, then this actually makes the transaction uh, not allowed. We did not say that dealing with Devon Bank is harm. We didn't we didn't say that dealing with Universal Islamic Financial is, is harm. We said that the best available option is guidance residential. If someone is in desperate need or in like real need to buy a house and he or she cannot finance with guidance, then they can go with either Devon Bank or with with, or with the University of Islamic Finance. Jazakumullah <coughs> for that answer. Actually, Amja, who the chef is a uh, part of the member of the committee, Amja, which is Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. They actually came out with a detailed fatwa in specifically in regards to home loans where all these questions in regards to home loans, which is, you know, which model they use and what makes it permissible and recommendations to make it compatible is available online that you can download and read. 
uh, at your convenience. Also, I'd like to share mention the presentation. He barely covered because it's over 100 slides, and we have the we have the uh, the presentation that the sheikh has shared with us. So, for those who are interested, you can reach out to me or Brother Samir, and we can get that to you as well. And that will, inshallah, answer a lot of the questions as well. So we'll come back to uh, one written question here, which uh, says for home loans. How about, and uh, I've read this question, I think it might have already been covered in the presentation, but I'll go ahead and read it. How about buying home for 4% on top of the original price? For example, 200,000 at 4% equals to 220,000. Is it permissible if the financer at first didn't own home, just bought on borrower's name? No, it's not. No, absolutely no. The bank has to buy the house. Whether, whether the bank goes with Murabah, or goes with, with, with Ijara, or goes with, 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 uh, with Musharraf, a diminished partnership. This is a very fundamental step that has to be taken. Because when you go with the Murabah, like buying first and then selling for, for profit, okay, that's called Murabah. The, the, the bank has to buy the house for 100, and then a different transaction can sell it to you for 105, 110. But he has to buy the house. When it comes to Ijara, which is which is a lease to purchase, the bank has to own the house. Okay, so to become like the legal lessor, okay, muajjal lessor, and then based on the ownership, he can lease the house for you for whatever you know uh, duration of the, of the contract, and then just change the, the, the ownership from him to, to you. So ownership is a must. When it comes to uh, Musharaka, which is a diminishing partnership, which is the, you know, the mode of finance of guidance uh, residential, they have no choice but to own the house, to be, to be a legal partner in owning the, the house. So ownership actually is a must. And the main concern that we have in, in our Fiqh Council is the, is the, is the actual implementation of the ownership issue. Do they really do they really own the house before selling it? That's a big question mark that you know makes us really you know uh, hesitant, reluctant to say that yes, dealing with those companies is it's halal. Because we really doubt the process itself. Because simply I mean all these companies they they, they do not refinance, they, they sell their contracts to Freddie Mac. Okay? And in order for them to be those contracts to be like syllable to Freddie Mac, they have to comply with Freddie Mac rules and requirements. So just to make a joke with them, I know them very well. I, I said that your content is a, is a Freddie Mac compliant, it's not a Sharia compliant. Do we have any questions from the sister's side that they want to ask on the microphone? If not, we'll come to the mother's side. Right here. Uh, I understand what the Mushara can understand that uh, in principle, a contract on their correct that sometimes, in practice, they don't follow uh, what is necessary of a uh, partnership. But when it comes to the Murabaha, I feel like there's, and of course you know better and you can let me know, I feel like even in contract, the way these companies are implementing it, it's flawed to begin with. Um, mainly, not because of the Murabaha is incorrect, but mainly because in their contract, they already tell their clients that if they were to pay the full amount in advance, let's say they got a bonus or something, they paid it off, they would discount that purchase price down to whatever, let's say it's one year later, they would look at how much it was going to recruit, and they just give you the title over at that point, they discount the whole price. Isn't that fundamentally flawed to begin with? This particular point is, is called Ba'wa Ta'ajjal. Ba'wa Ta'ajjal means pay early and enjoy a discount. Now this is a debatable issue between, between like different, different schools of thought and different, different madahib. If I still recall, Devon Bank actually does not. Well, it has been mentioned in the in the contract clearly that that they do not have to make a discount, but but they do a discount. Why? Just to comply with the fact that that if the discount is made as a courtesy from the uh, um, uh, from the seller or the lender here, because the, you know the transaction is over once you buy. Then the house is yours, and you owe you owe that money as a as a borrower from from the bank. Is that correct? So they say that 
we don't have to do it by contract in principle as you said but we do it as a courtesy in the matter of fact legally speaking they have to do it I mean this is I mean this is the law you know very well that that mortgage business is a highly regulated business in the US you cannot play with the terms or change anything without being approved for them so to answer the question yes they do it and that is I mean if, if the two parties are are obligated obligated to accept the discount because of early payment that is that is that is a like a debatable issue is it counted as riba or not to my knowledge yes it is counted as riba because extra payment because of the, of the delay is equal to less payment because of the early, early payment I agree with you not only that I think, by the way even the murabaha the murabaha in principle is very debatable very believe it or not until today there are a lot of like well-known mashayikh and scholars, they doubt even the legitimacy of the murabah to start with. Even if it is done accordingly, even if the bank is buying the house and closing it and then reselling it again, they still doubt it. Uh, because it does not involve a real and actual partnership. It's just, it's just a way or a trick to make, you know, to make money. Providing that in the reality, in the ground, they do not hold the title for, for a period of time. Sometimes they do it a simultaneous Closing in the same table in the same meeting, they just close uh, first closing and the second closing, which makes it like uh, like very very nominal, uh, makes it very very close to like interest bearing interest bearing. Law. I I hundred percent agree with, you, but this is you know the, the unfortunate reality that we are experiencing. Do we have any more written questions that need to be passed up here? If not, we'll come to uh, the question from the brother's side. So, so uh, selling a house using conventional loan is not permissible. About, I'm sorry, buying is not permissible. About seven. And when you sell your house to somebody else, you should not care about the source of his money. If you are the owner of the house and you want to sell your house to someone who is willing or who is in the process of getting his loan from countrywide or from any other uh, mortgage company, you should not care about that. Because the, the purity and the permissibility of his income or his source of money is his responsibility, it's not your responsibility. Evidence for that is that the Prophet used, used to transact with the Mushrikeen, infidels in Mecca al Mukarram, and then with the, with, the, with the Yahud, with the Jewish community in Medina, knowing that they used to transact with, with riba. Is that correct? It was never ever reported that, that Prophet investigated you know, the source or the purity of income or the permissibility of income of any one before, before transacting with him. Now, this is the default rule. Unless if I know for sure that, you know, someone is bringing me a stolen money or extorted money in which the legitimate owner is still there, that's, that's uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a kind of exception. But if he is dealing with riba, that's, that's his problem, it's not my problem. Next question from Brother Sank. Salaam uh, alaikum. My question to you is I want to borrow $1,000. I go to three different banks. One bank says you need to pay me $1,100 after one year. The other bank says you need to pay me 3% interest, which is haram. The other bank says you give me a survey charge which is about 4%. So which is the better option to go with? Now, I'm repeating the None. question. None. None of them. All of them are hard. Because the first bank says, we are not charging interest, give me $1,100 end of a year. That is, that's interest, because you have borrowed 1000 and the interest rate does not have to be a percentage. It could be just a lump sum. Yes, it's a lump sum. Well, that is, that's interest. It's the same. In principle, it is the same. You take 1,000, you pay it 1,100. You take 1,000, you pay 4%, 3%, 1,000, 2,000. Whether it is like, like you know, a number or like a lump sum or it is a percentage, it doesn't make any difference. It's still hard. Because in the end of the day, the financial institution also incur a charge, whether paying the salary for the employees or paying the... Well, that's, the, 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 that's the, a different story. They can, they can make their profit in a halal way if they would like to. They can go with the Islamic, with the with, with the Islamic modes of finance if they want, like to make their, you know, their money. I, I completely understand that the bank is not a 
a charitable organization. It is, it is for profit business. I, I completely understand. But they have to do their business accordingly. That's the issue. And I'm not against the idea that they, that they need to make money. I agree with you. But they have to make their money in a halal way. That's the issue. Any questions from the sisters? No? Okay, we'll come back to the others. Uh, the brother who asked uh, this one, uh, the source of his cell. Now, I was speaking to one of the CPA, he said all the finance, Islamic finance, where do they get the money from? So, for us, it doesn't matter where is anybody who called Islamic finance, their source. Is it not the central bank? That's my when we issued a fatwa regarding regarding guidance and other and other Islamic mortgage companies, we made it clear that this fatwa is not for the company itself. This fatwa is for potential clients who want to finance with guidance. Can you buy your house financing with guidance residential? Our our fiqh council answer is yes. But we made it clear that we did not investigate, we did not analyze the Hong Kong law, we did not analyze the agreement between guidance residential and, and Fadimek because of lacking data. We do not have any documents. Verbally, they told me, they know me very, very well. They, they said that we, 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 we developed a partnership with Fadimek. So they are not buying our contracts. They are joining us as partners in the ownership of the houses that we already financed for our clients. Now, this is their claim. Do we, as a federal council, do we have any any, any, any legal documents that we can read and say, yes, this is correct or this is um, wrong, we do not have any. I wish this point is clear. But they're paying the interest of the defending guidance. And they issue a Again, we do, not, we do not have any documents. The only documents we have is the contract that they sign. They also, they also issue the, at the end of Can the I finish, please? Can I finish, please? They, they, the only thing that we have and made our photo based on is the contracts and other legal you know, documents that they sign with their client. Based on the document, we are, we are, a, very, we are a very like data-driven you know, fiqh council. We have, we have data, we have documents. We studied, we analyzed, account, we said that yes, this contract is Islamically, accept, it's not an ideal one, it is acceptable. Because this is the only option we have. The other option is just to go with the with the pure state for world interest. But again, when it comes to the connection or the relationship between guidance residential and Freddie Mac, we do not have any documents. But the relationship between that's guidance that's my answer. Okay, we'll uh, move on to a written question here. Do we have to make any contract? Or a contract between for good loans for Qardi Hassana because people are not paying back. So can we ask any property uh, as collateral towards the loan? You should actually ask. And, and, and in your introduction, you said that the longest ayah in the Quran yeah. is ayah to Dain, right? Yes. Uh, and then the next ayah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "When you come to my house, you will find a book written by Rihan, believe it or not, means, means mortgage, but the Islamic mortgage, not the, not the American one. Mortgage actually is to put a lien or to mortgage the property of the borrower, okay, or the one that who owes you money in order for you to secure your money, right? So having a collateral or putting his property uh, in, in, on, on hold or mortgaging it or putting a lien on it actually is in a compliance with the sin of the Prophet, alayhi so the you know the answer is uh, is yes you should you should do it to secure your to secure your money. Now when the sister do not ask any question, it has two different possibilities. Either they understood everything. <laughs> I didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question from the brother Snake. Uh, so, uh, one of the analogy uh, I heard a lot about this. Uh, where this money is coming from for Islamic finance? The answer is, okay, you enjoy the chips, don't worry about the package. And the other thing is, like, when you said uh, the party, other party should be, uh, should take a risk, but in this case of uh, uh, guidance financing, they don't, they're not taking any risk at all. Insurance is the other party's responsibility. If, 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 if any, in any case, if it becomes a defaulter, you know, it's going to be repossessed anyways. Just like the other bank. And also, 
when you do what went through the application process, they said you did exactly the same process, and, and the person is usually ending up paying at least probably one or one and a half point extra. And plus these administrative fees, and sometimes like the practices are so abusive, like right? so when people somebody wants to uh, let's say want to change the escrow account, there are, there are higher fees. Like, so you can. If you compare it with other like uh, conventional mortgages, no, but okay, let's let's l- let's 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 differentiate between between according to your statement abusing the Muslim class and taking advantage of them because they want to be practicing Muslim and they want to stay away from riba versus committing a haram transaction. Um, are they abusing you know people and taking advantage of them up to a certain limit? Unfortunately, unfortunately, yes. Uh, is the is the partnership a nominal one and not a real one? Yes, it is. I agree with you. I'm not saying that 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 guidance residential is executing and conducting a pure halal, legitimate, authentic, sound Islamic finance. They are not. They are not. Now, the the the. I forgot the third point. But anyway, I will answer the question. Now, the risk. Yeah, well, yeah, when it comes to the risk, have you read their, their contract? There is one, there is one scenario called, called uh, like terminating the partnership based on ominent domain. Ominent domain, they call it? Like when? Imminent, I'm sorry. Imminent, imminent domain. Like when the house is taken by force by the authority. For example, if you want to like demolish the, the, you know, the, the house, imminent domain. Thank you. Uh, like an, um, like making a road or a street or, or whatever. In this particular case, yes, they share they share the loss w- with their client. But if you, as a client, if you decide to terminate the partnership with them by law or by the agreement, you have to pay them off whatever they have paid for you. Only and only in case of eminent domain, they share the loss with you. This actually makes you know. Th- this actually increases the permissibility maybe a little bit. <laughs> Okay, we have time for just two, just two more questions. So, last opportunity for the sisters. Any questions? No questions. So we'll come back to the brothers. Assalamu alaikum. If I'm uh, selling a car for five thousand cash price and uh, in-house financing for seven thousand dollars, if for one year, the customer comes back and say after six months. I would like to, uh, you know, pay off the car. Can you discount the extra thousand dollar that you have? By law, I mean by Sharia, do I have to? Do I have an option to discount it to him, or do, do I must collect the entire thousand dollars? You don't have to, but but you have the right to discount. That's da'wah ta'ajjal. This is the exact, you know, uh, like gesture that Prophet has made to some of the Sahaba, and they were like, you know. Was a certain incident, so he said, "Like this means means that what happened? Like take this, then the actual amount, and just just let them go." I don't want to mention the incident. So that can be modified, like six months. Down. That is that is your right. Are you are you the seller or the buyer? I'm the seller. Okay, you have the right to discount them, but you don't have to, because because the price is fixed. Fixed means fixed, closed. That's it. But uh, as a courtesy to encourage him to pay off in full, you can you can say you, you know what. Pay me, pay me eight hundred out of one thousand, and you're good to go. I'm just waiting the two hundred thousand. So if you initiate, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you know, this 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 option, that is fine. But it cannot be written as a binding clause in the contract. It should not. Okay, last question. We can make an exception for the sisters, though, if they have a question. They know everything. <laughs> they know everything is what the sheikh <laughs> is saying. Assalamu alaikum. You spoke about the capital gain from uh, investment in stocks, and you talk about a small percentage of non Islamic clients, and you've mm-hmm. said that there's some way to find out what the percentage is, but you didn't mention anything about what to do with it. What is the process of purification of the investment? That's a good question. It depends on what kind of authority. Or whether or not you have a word to say when it comes to investing, or, or uh, investing in your portfolio, is it your call 
do you participate in making decisions or it's something absolutely out of your control? To my knowledge, if someone works for the government, he or she does not have 401k, you have what's called pension plan. Pension plan just is, is a secret. We do not know how this money is, is invested. Okay? If, if you're talking about pension plan, just keep the money as is. If there is any way in the future to find out how much harm or riba okay, or interest have been involved in this amount, just, just get rid of it. If you ended up with 10% harm, okay, the 10% have to be get have to be getting rid of and the 90% is still is still halal. When it comes to pension plan during the investment time, during your employment, there is no way. But if it is a 401k, you just share the portfolio with that company. You take a permission if you're from your investment company, Fidelity, for example. Take your portfolio and just share it with a Zan fund or with a man. They have their own software. They enter, you know, they do like a data entry into the information. And based on their, like, you know, standards, they can tell you that, oh, this is an insurance company, remove it. Oh, this is this is alcoholic company. This one, uh, like, again, you know, uh, their investment is, again, in the environment. They cause a lot of pollution. This one is involved in, in military, you know, uh, uh, activities. This one is uh, is obscene materials, I uh, say. So they, they can just issue a report to you telling you that this is the percentage of the haram involved based on our analysis. To my knowledge, their analysis is... I would say at least 90% you know, uh, accurate. Once you find out, is your question? Yeah. Once you find out, if you can get rid of that haram percent, if you can change it to a halal one, like stop investing in those companies and just you know, turn your investment to something else, then you have to do it. But if it is not your option, which is most probably the case, because you are one of tens of thousands of, of, of employees who are investing with fidelity for example just keep it as is once you receive the money you get rid of that particular haram percentage because the particular haram percentage you know does not contaminate the rest of the you know the, of the of the account and make it haram for the detailed answer thank you very much uh, with this being said um, i'm pretty sure we have some more questions but unfortunately we're out of time